Well, let's go ahead and share this, Scott. What do you think? Slides. We don't need no stinking slides, right? We don't need no slides. Who needs slides? Okay. So today we wanted to uh, take a moment and talk about tactical tripwires with you guys. We think that this is a, a uh, an important subject for everybody's environment because the idea here is we need to be able to detect the adversary behaving inside the environment and and capture them at an early stage. The I think the the real question is if you know that there's going to be a compromise at some point in time, but you can catch the adversary early on and before they can do any damage, is that good enough? So let's start with some introductions. Scott, you want to go first? Yeah. So hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to the webcast today. Uh, my name is Scott Lynch, uh, packet engineer on Twitter and LinkedIn. <clears throat> I'm an instructor for Security 555 SIM and Tactical Analytics. I'm also a course author. Uh, so we're trying to bring the goodness to the uh, the community to uh, to spread the word. Uh, I feel like I'm getting ready to go into a uh, to a hymn here, uh, Gene. Um, spread the word of the gospel of the sim. If everybody uh, would open their hymnal to page three twenty one, so page five five five. Certainly feels that way because uh, there's still uh, there's still a lot of awesome stuff to do in sim, and there's a lot of places we can do that. We're going to talk touch on that quite a bit today whether it be in your enterprise or even in your home labs uh, or even in a portable tactical perspective. Um, but uh, previous coming to SANS, I was the manager of security operations uh, for our global aerospace company. Um, and I spent 10 years with the U.S. Navy uh, doing electronic warfare and uh, air crewman on the P-3 uh, and got a little time on the S-3 Viking. So been around for a little while, uh, been working in security for roughly 26 years. I uh, used to be a Cisco instructor for Cisco IT Academy. For about 13 years and then uh you know welcome to sans so anyway i'll kick it over to gene uh to uh to kind of present himself here all right so my name is gene mcgowan uh like scott i am an instructor for sec 555 sim with tactical analytics i have been in this space for uh just just a little while i have a little bit of gray hair right here on one temple and that's it um i also started in the navy and my very first command you know i I, I, I got started in, in computers um, back when everything was a monochrome green screen and very large CRTs that would take up the majority of your desk. And I thought to myself, I really have uh, minimal interest sitting at a monitor all day, every day. So I joined the Navy. And the first thing they did is put me in charge of all the computers on, top, on the ship. So I became, back then, we didn't have information security officers. I was the automated data processing security officer. Along the way, I have branched out in addition to information security, I've earned uh, MCSE. So uh, back when it was uh, NT, NT351, I think was my first MCSE platform. Also Cisco certifications, CISSP, and, and various uh, GIAC along the way. All right. Um, so I post just a little bit of housekeeping for everybody that is online and watching this right now. I have posted in chat uh, that you can post any questions along the way. We've got uh, Q&A hmm. coming in. So the chat says chat. to post questions in chat, but chat is disabled. All right. So Emily, if you are there and you can enable chat. That would be probably absolutely fantastic. <laughs> um, I don't know if I can, but you can clearly the Q and A is working. So um, put your questions in the Q and A, um, and we'll keep that separate from in case you guys have any links to drop in chat right. or anything like that. So we will keep an eye on chat if it does become enabled, and we will keep an eye on Q and A as well uh, along the way. So, all right, Scott, let's get started. The idea here is, is we want to be able to capture the enemy, capture the adversary inside of our environment. The example in this is if you had a garden and you had cabbage in there, you had lettuce, you had all these things that are really, really yummy to, uh, to your local wildlife like the rabbit. The, the idea is, is we want to catch that rabbit trying to get into the garden and have their way with what we've worked so hard on. So in this picture, we see 
the fence and we see our garden, our network, and then we see the enemy on the outside of the fence. The idea is we want to be able to see when that rabbit is going to try to, how they're going to try to get in and, and capture that information. So I've had, I've had a garden. Scott, have you ever had a garden before? Yes. Uh, what didn't works best, long, but it, uh, but it, yeah, we did. What works best to keep rabbits out <laughs> besides a fence? Um, don't plant a garden. That works really well. That's right. They're always going to try. So one of the examples that I always uh, bring up too is, is sometimes you have to put that fence farther down on the ground because the rabbit will burrow, right? Have you seen a rabbit climb the fence? Absolutely. Have you ever seen a rabbit pole vault over the fence? I've seen that once. Took, taking a running leap, making it over the top. That's when we went with a six foot fence. So if you're uh, a fan of the cyber kill chain, one of the last things to do is to understand what is their action on their objective. So if an adversary is trying to get access into your environment, they're very often going to be trying to think of what do I want to accomplish here? And the number of most common things are going to be things like denial of service. They're going to try to take a system offline, try to destroy parts of your infrastructure if possible. Hacktivism, if they're politically focused, uh, they may be trying to do uh, come in and, and teach you a lesson on a political level, or they could be coming in to try to steal data. They could be looking for something uh, along, along those lines. Scott, would you add anything to this? Uh, no, unfortunately, I lost my chain of thought because I was trying to fix the chat. Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. That's I like right. something up here. <laughs> no, don't worry. So the idea is, is these things, the adversary doesn't just spontaneously come up with what the, what's going to happen. They're thinking about what their next step is going to be. And they're trying to think through what they want to do based upon what they want to accomplish. So there's going to be very specific behaviors that they're going to try to implement. And we want to capture that as quickly as possible. So the whole concept is we want to set tripwires. A tripwire is something that is very simple. It's a digital type of silent alarm. And the logs that we're going to collect are the wire that's going to indicate that something is tripped. And the SIM is going to be the tool that makes the alarm. So in essence, the basic concept here is we want to create a minefield inside your environment. And every time that the adversary tries to make a move, he can't go very far without stepping on a mine. The idea is, is he steps on a mine or she steps on a mine and we capture enough information to know, to be aware of their presence and be able to respond correctly. So everybody remembers Minesweeper. Um, I think this is probably the most apt analogy uh, leveraging tripwires inside your environment. Yeah, and the thing to, to keep in mind too with tripwires like this or whatever tripwire you decide to implement or types of tripwires is that they're generally high fidelity. Um, they're not as much of a false positive short of your IT staff falling into their own tripwires. Um, so tripwires. You know, yeah, if you, if you see one of these go off, Generally speaking, it's something you want to investigate. We live in a world within the SIM community and security in general where we are inundated with alerts. And so we're not trying to throw something at you that's going to cause more noise and more complication for your job uh, to make your job into a minefield, so to speak. <laughs> we're trying to figure out a way to make it a little bit more um, uh, useful. Um, and so th th this was kind of the reason behind you know doing a talk on virtual tripwires is you know, there's a lot of discussions on honey pots, honey nets, and different things like that. Um, but I very rarely ever run into people that have actually implemented them. Uh, in fact, I've had one student in the last three years of teaching that actually used these inside their environment pretty regularly. Um, and I brought it up because he actually has a tendency to trigger the trip, the 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 actual honey pot himself. So, <laughs> point is, they work, um, and it's something you could definitely experiment with. So, back to you, Gene. All right. So, um, you know, one of the objectives is, is they want to find data. They're on a data hunt, trying the adversaries inside your environment, whatever they're, however they got access. We don't really care at this point. 
we're trying to capture their behavior as they're trying to navigate your environment. And how they navigate your environment will depend on what their objective is. One of the big objectives is they want to find data. They want to find information that they can, you know, sell on the dark web. They can uh, compromise the information. They can share it publicly. Whatever it is, they're going to try to do it. So some of the ways they do this is they're going to scan your network. They're going to look for a place where maybe data is being shared and it shouldn't be being shared. So they're going to implement, they're going to leverage network scanning. They're going to crawl for finding specific types of shares and folders. Okay. And all they're trying to do is steal, alter, or destroy it. This is, again, like Scott was saying, this is very prone to false positives. So you need to deploy something that's going to be more definitive and intentional. And like always, we're trying to present ideas, concepts that should be able to work in your environment that will be relatively low maintenance and simple to deploy. So file auditing. This is going to be an example of they're going to leverage automated scripts. They're going to leverage malware to try to find patterns. Thing, things they're going to look for, anything that's labeled something secret, top secret, anything that gives the intention, gives the uh, tips the hand that they that they think that they're finding something really special. They're also going to be looking for things like social security numbers, credit card information, and they're going to do this by enumerating and reading through the files. So as they're scanning through this, we need to be able to capture it, right? So the goal is we want to detect file and folder access. The number one way to be able to accomplish this is leveraging group policy or scripts on Linux. If you're worried about false positives in your environment because you have a lot of people scanning folders and doing things as part of their normal behavior, make it a hidden folder. So that if it is a hidden folder and it is scanned and that alert gets generated, you have a greater level of fidelity of the type of behavior that's being that's taking place inside your environment. The other thing you can do is you can limit administrator, limit it to administrator access only. Okay. You can disable your security software tools from scanning specific locations. And then you just enable the auditing. So if there is a file crawl taking place inside the environment, you're going to capture it with simple group policy management and Linux scripts. Scott? Yeah, I actually, so I, I guess this makes sense since I teach Sim and I do this for a living, uh, but I actually do this at home <laughs> um, because I got the idea that, you know, if I was to put sort of like a, think of it as a canary token almost uh, on my system. That if a system was to scan the network, the, the the computer itself, and try to grab a file, I wanted to know about that pretty quickly, um, rather than waiting until my machine was, you know, dumping data out to the internet, or you know, if I wasn't looking at the firewall stuff like that. So there's some really simple things we can do, that you know, obviously test these first before you put them in production, um, because you don't want <laughs> everything triggering uh, alerts uh, for everything that's legitimately getting touched, but. There's definitely some benefits to trying this stuff out at home. Um, and then, of course, you know, trying to see what value you can add in your environments, um, especially if you have children. I hate to say this, but like I have computers for my daughters I bought uh, about a year ago because um, they needed an upgrade and uh, they're Windows. So we crossed over from the Mac universe into the Windows side. And, um, <clears throat> and I'm thinking to myself, you know, I really need to kind of know when they're doing that Minecraft mod. If uh, something in that file they downloaded doesn't trigger something else, uh, it'd be nice to know about that ahead of time. So, um, you know, what is it? Your girls were into Minecraft. Yeah, they were. Well, they used to be. Now they're they've moved on to the Roblox and uh, you know everything else, Sims and Genshin Impact and all that good stuff. But re the reality is, I have to keep an eye on them because basically there are two users on my environment. <laughs> Who knew, right? Your family yes. members would become users. So. Um, anyway, <laughs> <laughs> totally, totally new world, right? All right. Exactly. So another thing that the adversary is going to do inside the environment is they're going to try to identify where to go. They want to know what they can see, what kind of services are running, what kind of uh, what, what kind of protocols are operating on different hosts. So they're going to do something like network scan. Okay. 
and they're going to look for very um, specific types of types of things to be able to try to capture what their next move is inside your environment. Okay, the uh, our goal here is we want to capture that behavior and identify a couple of ways to do that. So one is is we can throw a honeypot out there that is going to respond to some very common ports. So port 80, port 443, 137 to 139. These are all common ports that are used by the adversary to see what's operating on different hosts inside of that particular environment. Now, this is what we would call a low interaction type of honeypot. There's really two types of uh, significant honeypots out there. And Scott, I put in a slide at the end of this to talk about the, uh, the Deutsche Telekom, the honeypot to rule all honeypots. Um, and, and we can jump to that uh, towards the end if we have time. But the idea is, is we just want to see if there is an unauthorized source scanning the network. That's going to be, again, they step on that mine. We know that is not normal behavior. And we're going to be able to capture that early on before they get to the next stage where they can start creating damage inside of our environment. So the two types of honeypots that you can put into your environment, one is going to be a very high interaction honeypot. This is used mostly in research types of scenarios. This is something that you, you, you build up and then you usually, you would just throw this out on the internet with no protection, no firewall. You would just observe and collect all the data that you can from this particular research style honeypot. And then you would spend time and days, hours, uh, possibly weeks, evaluating and analyzing the log data of what happened when, from where, and how access was made. What we're suggesting is using a low interaction honeypot. This is used just for early detection. It's very limited in what it's going to collect and what it's going to show, okay? So this is going to be potentially something that you can distract an attacker with, okay? And it's not going to have any complex types of scenarios. Basic logging from these machines is all that you need. Scott, yeah, anything you wanna chime in on? Yeah, I would just say from the enterprise perspective, right? Um, this is such a cheap, easy thing to do, um, especially if you spin up like a just a virtual machine, right? Um, and it could be something as simple as I, my gut wants to say Windows Seven because everybody's like got free copies of Windows Seven at this point from leftover days of when Seven was still out there. But you know, Windows Eleven, Windows Ten, whatever you can turn the Windows firewall on, and then basically set it up uh, like we indicated in the slides. And the idea here is the ports that you saw that are getting scanned are the default ports usually used by Nmap. So for your, your kind of like, uh, I hate to use the word script kitty, but you know, the, the, the attacker that basically is just kind of running off the, the generic script, if you will, there's a good chance that they're going to hit most of those ports trying to figure out what they don't know. I mean, imagine I dropped you into an environment and I said, figure out your way out of this system. Um, <laughs> you're going to have to poke around and figure out what's going on. So uh, hey, it's just welcome. a great way to do it. And, you know, you can put them anywhere. If you have a large enough enterprise, and I'm assuming most of you are at one, um, you know, it's not that hard to spin up a virtual machine, right? Uh, the other aspect is if you can do this at home, again, this is another example of a quick win. Uh, you put a box on your network and suddenly you see things talking to it, uh, you might want to start asking questions. Um, it's not unusual to see traffic within your network at home that you can't always explain, especially with a lot of IoT stuff. Um, you know, I have video lights, for example, these are key lights from uh, Elgato, those are network based, so they generate packets and traffic and if you fire up, uh, you know, uh, network monitoring on your network using Zeek or Security Onion or, you know, whatever, Wireshark even, um, you can see some of that traffic and be like, okay, hey, what the heck is this? So having it at home, it teaches you how to use it. And then when you go into your enterprise or uh, your, uh, your company, um, you can take advantage of uh, using this as a quick indicator. Um, you're always going to have somebody that pokes around. Um, we've always got that one person in the company. Um, I'm not going to okay. use it right now, but <laughs> we're, not we gonna mention people. Any, we're not going to mention any names, but his initials are Gene McGowan, right? Yeah, there you go. 
I'm going to scan the book today. <laughs> What's the worst thing that could happen? Exactly. All right. So, but let's say you don't have access to being able to stand up a honeypot. Okay. That's okay. Because one of the things that you can do is you can just use a Windows firewall or really almost any firewall to be able to be a type of honeypot for you. So an example here is going to be uh, at the bottom. You would you would you would create a rule that allows authorized scanners and management tools inside your environment. So you would not log any data from tools that you know are part of your 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 tool stack, your suite of applications that you use in your environment. You would block common ports on your Windows host. So from the previous example here, 80, 443, 137 to 139, you would block those. But if anybody tried to access them, you would log that data, okay? And then that you would have a rule for de default denying no logging. So this, in, in a lot of ways, if you're looking to create that early detection system, again, you, you're, you're planting mines. You're, you are planting mines. And, and this is a cheap, easy you can put this out there on any number of hosts in this type of configuration with the with the least amount of effort and still capture the rewards of, of that network scan, an unauthorized network scan in your environment. Yeah, and real quick, just to add on to this, uh, you know, we're, we're talking about Windows here, obviously, because that's most enterprises are pretty comfortable. Your admins can blow those out, uh, deploy them pretty quickly. Um, you could use Linux, absolutely. In fact, the system we're going to show you later, uh, as long as I keep my comments to a minimum here um, we have time uh you'll actually get to see that but i just looked real quick uh because i'm always exploring new things uh, there's a raspberry pi version um there's quite a few projects out there so if you wanted to drop you know some bucks on getting a raspberry pi i just went to look you can't actually buy them apparently there was a shortage there for a while but it looks like amazon's got them um but you could easily uh you know deploy a pi on your network uh home or enterprise whatever you were allowed to do um, and then use it for the same features and benefits. So, yep. So another thing that uh, we know that the adversary is going to try to do, they're going to try to get privileged access. Oh, do you have an example of how you use Linux scripts to create a tripwire? Um, I am going to, uh, David, we're going to uh, uh, save that. And we may, that's going to be a little bit more in depth. Um, and if you can send us a PM, uh, we can probably send you a couple of links or send a response uh, by the, at the end of this too. So, um, but one of the things that they're going to do as an adversary is they're going to try to get administrator access. So the number one thing that they're going to they're, they're going to look for a way to get better credentials. If they are on a host and they have limited capabilities and they're just a user, they want to get they want to credential up. Right. So an example of that would be is going to be group querying. So all users on a host can list group members. So this would be an example of this would this would be something that you're going to query specifically inside of your sims, Scott. Would you agree? You would you would you create an instant alert on something like this, or would you just do a daily query? Uh, no, I would, the thing to keep in mind here, and of course, you're not getting the full context of the course is, you know, when we, <laughs> we, when we talk about these slides, we talk about them in the course, we're really saying, Hey, if somebody, you know, queries the domain admin group, uh, you might want to know about that because you have to ask yourself, how often do your users do this? I would say probably never. <laughs> unless so unless user they're system, and they're just trying to right. ruin your day. <laughs> and it's, it's, it's a snip. It's an easy win to kind of detect on this. Um, even if it is a false positive, because maybe an admin is doing it. I've always come from the world of there should be a ticket indicating somebody is maintaining a system or working on it. And if I know that they're engaged in doing that effort, then I can say the alert is a fault. You know, it's a false alarm. But if I see these commands and theoretically you've got command line logging, auditing, process creation, all the good stuff turned on, and your sim's actually pulling those logs in, you should see this and be like, hey, that's uh, interesting. Now, it does not mean that some scripts may not run these commands, that you may have some uh, uh, maintenance scripts that run uh, from your admin team, uh, but just be aware of that. That's stuff that we can deal with, we can tune out and, and, and deal with it, so. 
Yeah. So one way to be able to audit this, and this is just a quick example in here, is, is this is uh, auditing for domain admins. So anytime that this object is read and and information is, is collected, it's going to create event 4662. So this is one of the ways that you can come in with your group policy, start auditing for this particular type of event. All right. So what about denying access to that? If we deny access to this, don't we do we solve the problem or do we create a new problem? I think it could be either or. You might solve the problem of people looking and reading what the what the accounts are. But you're also tipping your hand to the adversary that you're trying to keep them from being able to read the read the read the accounts. So one of the can you do it? Absolutely. You can deny access to this. But the challenge becomes now you've tipped your hand to the adversary that you're trying to leverage more prevent technology for their behavior. Scott, anything you'd add? Yeah, and I think in this example too, I would say in the case of a deny list, which would be kind of a, a, a different way of looking at this from say a firewall's perspective where we would deny the actual action. In this case, we're basically saying if something is a member of a deny list, we would generate an alert on that that we would then investigate and deal with from that perspective. So we don't necessarily have to shut the, the command down. Again, there may be need for scripts or tools to pull these commands. You'll be amazed. The more you dig into your system, and I'm going to assume a lot of you do, you will see things that you're like, wow, I just can't believe that that's actually happening. Um, that's pretty much every day I look at a sim. Uh, but in this example here, we're just simply saying build a, a list that can look for these kind of things. And then worst case, uh, generate an alert for somebody to go investigate if we see this. If we do long tail analysis as well, if you're familiar with the concept of least frequently occurring and most frequently occurring events, you can look for the one-off of this happening. And then from, and from my perspective, if I have one machine in a sea of 10,000 that ran this command, um, that's a high fidelity indicator of something to go look at. You know exactly what machine was impacted. Um, and if you have any concerns, take it offline and do forensics instead of response. Yep. All right. So a couple other, we, we've got, I don't know, I think we're almost, we're a little bit over halfway through. So this is perfect timing on this. And um We'll get it. I think we're going to have time for it to pull up teapot as well uh, by the end of this uh, webcast. So breach canaries. The whole idea here is, is you're creating uh, canaries. Um, in the old days, when people would go down into uh, coal mines, they would bring a canary in a bird cage. And the idea was they're more sensitive to toxic gases than, than humans are. And the, the, I, the for the coal miner, if they ever looked over in the birdcage and that canary is down on the floor in the bottom of the birdcage, that means there's gases present that are strong enough to kill the bird and it's time to get out of the mine. So these concepts that we're providing uh, uh, through this webcast are really the concept of the breach canary. So what are the key techniques that we know the adversary is going to use? How are we going to capture that information into our SIM? and then indicate and, and combine that with known behavior around data breaches and have that be our breach canary inside the environment. So again, just like with uh, the, the credential list, if who runs that? It never gets run. A couple other ideas for breach canaries along this way is X forward four. So this is from a, a different uh, section of the course. But I think this would be a great indicator as well. If you know that you have a, a proxy inside your environment and everybody is supposed to use a dedicated proxy, but you're getting X forward four packets and data from a different host that is not that authorized proxy, that would be an indicator that there is something compromised inside your environment. And it can be indicative of a man in the middle attack inside your environment as well. Scott, any thoughts? Uh, not particularly. You hit the you hit it on the mark here. We're just trying to find out if we're we have something going on here, especially with the rise of the uh, usage of things like the Wi-Fi pineapple and now the Wi-Fi coconut from Hack Five. Um, mm -hmm. It's not that difficult to 
pull off some of these man in the middle attacks, or I wouldn't even call it an attack so much as a man in the middle uh, observation. <laughs> <laughs> Say you're in a coffee pot or in a coffee pot. Geez, if you're in a coffee pot, we got a bigger problem. No, if you're in a <laughs> coffee shop um, or an airport, um, it's just a, it's always good to question whether you should be using open wireless. Uh, you know, when you're out and about. So um, things we can think about. Yep. All right. So another example would be creating a honey token. So this is, a, you know, the great, exa great example of this is from Cliff Stahl and his book, The Cuckoo's Egg, right? The, the, the whole book is fantastic and I still have to finish reading it. But the, the concept is it's about a guy that tracked a spy inside the environment. Okay. So, and they, and they did this through creating honey tokens. They created a character inside their environment named Barbara, right? If I remember correctly. And, and, and then tracked that and tracked anytime that particular user was attempting to log on. It was a completely fictitious scenario. So the idea is, is you can create fake data meant for an attacker to steal and then monitor that activity. So for example, Dritz Doorden would be an, uh, an account that you can create inside your environment and then capture any time that that false account is being leveraged or any time that the credentials are trying to be used or things like this. Uh, Jesus, uh, what, is the what is appropriate to detect an exfiltration? We have alerts based on the number of files within a period but there are many false positives when users or laptops update their drive at home. Oh, that's a great question. Uh, Scott, you want to take a stab at any of this or? I'm looking in two different questions. Sorry. <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay. So I've got one in the QA. I got one in the chat session. So, okay. Looking at the chat one real quick. What is the appropriate detection for exfiltration? Um, this is tough. So we're talking about, when we say exfil, we're saying almost like data leakage, right? If you look at DLP, um, you know, DLP was a product that was out for a long time. I guess it's still out there, uh, but most of the organizations I've been into don't leverage it necessarily. Um, when it comes to looking at uh, Canary tokens, as an example, I've used this pretty effectively uh, for my own clients, is by generating a file that basically has a built-in web bug, if you will. Um, if somebody takes, let's say, a Word document, Excel spreadsheet, whatever it might be, um, and that gets sucked up or vacuumed up in a in a in an exfil. Say somebody's trying to ransom your environment, um, it gets pulled up to Dropbox, you know, whatever. Um, those are definitely things that we can use uh, to help us. Um, but it, it's a lot bigger story than we have time to talk about when it comes to what is the appropriate detection for exfil, because it really depends on the data, right? Are we talking about databases? Are we talking about files? Are we talking about um, you know, this is and that's and whatnot. Um, let me just look in here. I saw the question up there. I apologize on the Q and a side. Um, the, the DNS record for the W pad pointing, um, that definitely could be something to look at. Um, Kurt, I don't know. Are you doing this right now? First, we have to, this isn't like Slack in our classrooms when we can normally be like, we can see when people yeah, are talking. We get, we get the pregnant pause and we have to kind of tap dance a little bit to see if he, if Kurt's going to type something in. Um, so the way I answered it is, you know, depending on the environment at a high level, I think this would be a great technique to explore. If you have access to be able to create those DNS records and you have access to generate the logs and capture the data, and that's the way you want to use that as a, uh, as a early detection, as that mine in your minefield, yeah, give it a shot. And I know we're trying to keep moving Kurt's, forward. Kurt's here. refilling his coffee cup right now. That's what I'm gonna. No, he responded. He's like, yes. Yeah. So I, I know we're tripping over ourselves because we're used to using using Slack. So I apologize to everybody. <laughs> oh, <there it> is. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Uh, so let's go on to the next one. So as an example, if we were to put these honey tokens inside of our environment, where are we going to be able to capture that behavior? Well, in, the, in this particular slide shows a lot of information that, you know, we cover in previous sections of 555. But number one, if it's in the database, you're going to be able to capture it in database logs. You're going to be able to create specific queries looking for that honey token 
from, from activity based on what's happening inside your database. Another example would be you can create a rule set inside of something like IDS or NDR and capture it inside your environment and, and have an alert or a rule that triggers an alert from those tools inside as well. And then a third example would be on a perimeter type of, a, uh, of device as well. So something like your next generation firewall, you would be able to create a rule inside that that detects anytime that honey token shows up inside of a log. Um, and depending upon what your level of analysis is, you can do one or all of these types of scenarios. Yeah, absolutely. Um, another example of something that you can do is you can put a web bug inside certain documents that you're putting out there as bait for the adversary, right? And if they get that and they get it out of your environment, this web bug is essentially going to phone home and let you know a little bit more information about that adversary. One, you know it's gotten out. And two, you're going to have information of that web bug coming back. So it's just a very, very small one-by-one -one pixel, okay, that you can use in HTML, Office documents, or things like that. When the document is opened, that particular one-by-one -one pixel image is loaded, and then that sends data back to a log in the form of a log that says, this image was loaded. So you're going to be able to capture the behavior of a document being opened. And, and again, you would now, you guys, ever, I'm sure everybody here has had that awkward situation where you filled out a form online to some security vendor, Palo Alto or somebody else, and you downloaded a PDF about a topic. And the moment you open that document, about 20 seconds later, your phone rings and it's a salesperson from, uh, from Palo Alto or whatever the name of the company is saying, hey, what do you think of that PDF you downloaded? I'd like to answer any questions you have. This and that. It's the exact same technology. They put a web bug inside that document so that they could tell when you've opened that document and, and started to read it. And because you filled out the form, they can they can correlate that data back to that particular form. You're the only person with that particular web bug. And they say, look, he's reading the PDF, great time to call. So it's an example. So marketing uses this. We should be able to take that exact same technology and leverage it to our advantage as well. So the whole idea is, is you plan a web bug, it phones home, and you have a clearer picture of what's what the adversaries access and how they're leveraging it. Scott? Anything yeah. to add? Not really. You hit it on the head. I want to keep us moving forward so we can get to. So we can get to the fun stuff and we can pull up Teapot. Yeah. All right. So another example would be Mimikatz Honey Token. Okay. This is a Honey user account. Okay. That is intended for the adversary to attempt to use for theft. Okay. This can spawn a process with fake credentials inside your environment. So another SANS instructor, a guy named Mark Baggett, who teaches uh, Python classes specifically for security uh, security use, created this. So this is this is on our GitHub, right? For five five five. Scott. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. So, so this is a tool that you can download and use. Uh, inside your environment. And then anytime that this is this particular fake that you set up this fake account and anytime that someone tries to use that particular set of credentials, you know where it's coming from. A couple more examples that we have as well. I'm just kind of double checking. You've got an eye on chat, so I'm not going to worry about that. Yep. Another one is PowerShell downgrade attacks. I think this is definitely one of those things that you would want to have an immediate alert on, okay? So if somebody has compromised an environment, one of the things they're going to try to accomplish is they want to leverage something that they can use to their advantage. Well, the more current versions of PowerShell, version 5 and later, are all so sophisticated with more and more security features that it's very common for the adversary to try to downgrade to an earlier version of PowerShell that doesn't have those security tools built into it. So 
this is an example of an event that you should tr you should be looking for and you should respond to immediately. Okay. Another one that we want to make sure that we cover too is is log clearing. So event ID 1102, anytime that you see an, uh, anything happen on a host where the logs are being cleared, that's not normal. That's just like looking for different credentials on the environment. That's like downgrading PowerShell. Anytime you see the logs being cleared, you're going to want to take an immediate action, at least to research what's happening. Now, it could be some guy on your IT team named Gene McGowan that's just out there screwing with you, but you want to take a look. These are, again, our high fidelity scenarios that can, can give you a hand. So this is an example of how you could take that data. And what we do in the class, we talk a lot about how to ingest data with aggregators like Logstash, and then how to have that do multiple things at the same time. So here we're generating this, adding a tag for alert. And in addition to sending it to the Elasticsearch backend, we're creating an email and we're creating PagerDuty notification as well. Yeah, the only caveat I would add is uh, just be aware that 1102 in the security channel is for log clearing. 1102 shows up also for RDP operational logs. And so if you start hunting just for event ID 1102, you may find some other things that'll take you down a rabbit hole. <laughs> so just pay attention to that, right? Right. We and and rabbit holes can be good and bad. <laughs> so Wowzers, right. That's right. So another thing that we could do is is you could leverage OSINT. So one of the courses at SANS is all about OSINT. And we we took a couple of the concepts there. And the idea is, is you just like we were talking about the Mimikatz account previously, you can put false information out. You can create Facebook accounts, you can create LinkedIn accounts, you can create slideware that includes information, and you can put that out there so that individuals that are trying to leverage OSINT as that initial foothold to, to try to get into your environment, you, you can cap, you can provide just enough as a teaser that when it's used, you know exactly where it's coming from, and you can then take whatever the appropriate response is. Block IP information, uh, do, do different things, whether it's an edge device or inter internal device as well. So put false information out and, and do that. So the example here is honey tokens against leveraging OSINT. Everybody, I, I'm, I have an Xbox. I've played every version of Halo out there. This is the next iteration of Halo from a security perspective. And, and just hide it in metadata in key public sites. So the example is Peter Parker at sec555.com. Anytime that it, it is likely to be picked up in OSINT and then anytime that it's leveraged in your environment, you're going to be able to capture that and use that to your advantage. Again, someone stepped on a mine, you now have more information to, to respond appropriately. Yeah, and this just is a quick side note before we go on to this, this will be very handy for the things we're going to show on uh, the teapot because in a lot of cases, you know, if, if I make a fake user account up on LinkedIn or Facebook or whatever, if somebody decides to scrape that using something like Recon NG um, or any other tool that's going to scrape OSINT information and pull it together for you, um, this uh, next thing we're going to show you uh, is a good place to kind of take a look for and potentially build an alert to look for it. All right. So there is a uh, a, a distribution, a, a honeypot of all honeypots out there. It is put together by Deutsche Telekom and it's called Teapot. Okay. So I've got the URL. You can get the, you can get a copy of the slides at the end of, uh, at the end of this, we'll make sure that it's all posted. But if you just do a quick search for Teapot and D Telecom, it'll come up in the first one, two or three uh, responses on a traditional Google search. So it includes Docker images for all of the following honeypots. So you can see Cisco ASA, Citrix, you'll see Elastic Pot, uh, Hell Pot, Log, Log 4 Pot. The list goes on and on and on. And it includes a number of different tools as well. So things that you're probably already using, CyberChef, okay, uh, GOIP information, 
uh, suricata. So the, it's both honeypots and tools. We're we 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 bring this up in every every slot every every class. Make sure that everybody's aware of this. This is a great way to get started to experiment with different honeypots inside your environment and determine what's going to be best. One of the other things that Scott and I were discussing, uh, I think it was just yesterday, was if you have a suspicion that there's something going on inside your environment, but you're having a hard time nailing down what's happening, you could deploy something like this inside of that particular network segment and just observe and see see if see if this can be used as as a early warning or a detection of that behavior and help clarify what's happening. Um, yeah, um, so Chad, that's a great question. Any recommendations on how to keep track of all these tripwires, hunting tokens, et cetera, and balance between keeping them hidden versus wasting sock time researching these? So I think that the the one of the things that I would answer, how I would answer that is, it's going to kind of depend upon your environment. If you think that you have, you, you've been struggling to get maybe better firewall rules for perimeter prevention or different things like that, I would concentrate on honey tokens that, that tip my hand in what I feel in a true analysis of my environment are maybe my soft spots and weak spots. And I would concentrate first on tripwires that help me shore up early indicators of those being compromised. Um, and then I would look at the next stage I would go to would be what would give me the next level of, of uh, valuable information, you know, high fidelity details for, for behavior inside my environment. Scott, would you add anything to that for an answer? No, oh, Scott's not going to, Scott's frozen. Either Scott's frozen or I'm frozen. I think Scott's frozen. I can hear and see Eugene. Okay. All right. Well, Scott's frozen. I'm going to let <laughs> Scott know that you're frozen. Um, he probably already knows. Okay. So from here, I'm going to jump out of the show. And I am going to bring over an example of this. And we'll see if Scott joins back in or not successfully in the meantime. But if you go to the if you go to the Deutsche Telekom site, this is going to be telecom security, all about the honeypots. They go through tons of details. We're on release 2204 at this point in time. And it again, it's the all-in-one multi-honeypot platform. You do not have to enable all of them. You can use this as a particular uh, type of golden image for honeypots inside your environment and only enable the ones that are of most interest to you, okay? So from here, there's tons of details, tons of information. They have a TLDR section. You can jump to system requirements. You can download the ISO from GitHub. It runs on AMD, it runs on ARM. This is probably one of the most simple deployments of, of a broad, powerful honeypot tool set that you can get started with. It's not necessarily perfect for every scenario. The objective is you pick what's gonna what you want to mm -hmm. try first. Scott, are you back? I am back. Sorry, I was uh, at a blue screen of death, which is kind of weird. It's always exciting. Nothing like a BSD to start your day. I love All that. Right. So we have this up and running in an AWS instance, and I think we've had it on only for a couple of days. Um, so this is going to be your interface into the environment. You'll be able to jump between a variety of different tools and see what's happening. Um, so what I've done is I've gone ahead and jumped into the number of Kibana dashboards that are available, that are part, that are included with this. And Scott, you let me know if you get to a point where you can, where you can jump in and do uh, any of this after your BSD or not. Yeah, I'll just keep an eye on you. Um, I, right. I can see it right now. I'm going to have to rebuild, reboot at some point, but. <laughs> this perfect timing, right? Yeah, so this is just an example of, of the 
honey trap dashboard. So in here, we haven't, I don't think we've customized anything in here outside of the date range. The only yeah, so thing that one of the links I think I put in the, I can't see it, uh, in the chat was the installation process for this. Basically, this is sped up at Amazon. Default installation. Yep. Um, follow the recipe and you're off to the races. Uh, the only thing I would caveat this with, this is running at 16 gig of RAM and two CPUs with about a 40 or 50 gig hard drive up on Amazon. This is going to cost a ton of money to run for 30 days. So after this session's over, I'm obviously going to shut it down. This was just for demonstration purposes. Just be yeah. aware of that. So you don't end up getting a credit card bill and come after Gene. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm, yeah. If you reach out to me with a credit card bill on Twitter, I'm not going to answer. Uh, <laughs> So, so this is, we, we found a couple of things that we thought were really interesting. One, this has not been running very long at all. And we've already been able to capture 40, over 43,000 attacks in this environment, on this environment, um, right off the bat. Another thing is down here, these top ASN numbers in the bottom left-hand corner, being able to uh, see what the most, the highest number of ASNs are. Uh, for this. One that we thought was really interesting is this eHealth Ontario. Why are we being attacked by a healthcare organization? What's happening? You know, so, of course, it always raises questions of what's happening in that environment that's creating this, that's, that's, that's permitting this to, to take place. Um, another item that we thought was pretty interesting on in being able to do this, and you can drill into this just like you can with any version of Kibana that, that you have deployed, but the ability to be able to take a particular IP and drill into additional data. So for example, we're going to automatically link into Talus from Cisco and start seeing the details on, on what we're collecting. So if you're looking for a relatively simple easy to use, quick to deploy type of honeypot that you can put out in your environment. This is not a bad way to get started and, and get going with your, your first set of honeypots uh, to determine what uses your own early detection system inside your environment. Scott, anything you want to add? Yeah, I guess what I would say is, you know, just thinking about what this is, right? This is a, a reasonably, you know, large virtual machine you would be building. Um, with a decent amount of resources to be able to, to run all these containers and whatnot. I think personally, this is great for looking at edge cases, uh, especially on the, I mean, if you go back to, can you go back to the teapot dashboard for a second? If you look at the teapot dashboard, you'll see uh, on the Kibana, sorry. Um, you will see, for example, it has a list of all the honeypot attacks uh, across the top graphic once it fills in there. So it should be yeah, the second one down. Um, and you can see, for example, we've had uh, 9,514 calorie attacks. Basically, we're running an SSH uh, host that anybody can connect to. It should be the second from the top. Uh, yeah, teapot. One more up. One more up. There you go. There you go. Okay, now I know what you This will actually show the top 10. And if you set your time to the last 24 hours, as an example, um, and, and the reason I'm kind of showing you this is to think about the spread of what we're seeing here, right? We're seeing SSH attacks. We're seeing scans, which, you know, you're going to see scans regardless. Um, but we're also seeing ASA connections where people are trying to actually connect to the ASA for the ASDM. Uh, for Cisco firewalls, we're seeing Citrix, we're seeing Elastic, we're seeing Logstash. So there's a multitude of scans that are happening. And so if you just have a typical traditional honeypot like we started out with, which is just a you know a host with a firewall on, you're going to see somebody trying to poke around and see what's going on. Instead, what we're suggesting here is you could see if people are looking for your Elastic environment, for example, if you have one, or if you have uh, Cisco firewalls, it, j just kind of sample examples here, right? Um, Personally, if I was going to run this inside my environment, I would use this uh, sparingly just because it is a big a bit of a resource hog. Um, if I was going to spin up a, a honeypot, I would probably spin up something simple like the Windows host, or um, we actually teach the the Calry, um honeypot, which is basically just a Docker container that you download and run in a virtual Linux host, and you can do basically the same thing. Because um, remember, we're trying to keep it tactical. We're not trying to capture every single 
aspect of every single thing. We don't have the storage space and and the resources in a lot of cases to deal with that much data. Um, so in this example, we're not I'm just trying saying, to create research honeypots. We're trying to create. Yeah, I mean, if I saw 31 Cisco ASA attacks as an example, and this was inside my environment, I'd be nervous, right? <laughs> Assuming I have Cisco. <laughs> If I don't have ASAs and I'm looking at uh, specific, uh, what would you call it? Uh, somebody's scanning for ASAs, but we have Palo Altos, for example, or Fortinets or whatever. Uh, that's still an indicator because it's not an admin, right? Because <laughs> right? the admins, I hope, know what we have uh, architecture-wise. So yeah. just things to keep in mind. Um, so I'm looking at your comment, Chad. Um, I finally got the... Uh, the comments coming in on the question and answer. So in order to keep track of these, one of the things that, I, you know, so when I was working at the aerospace company, I was a manager, I was in the management team. And so since I had to manage architecture and people and projects and plans, you know, the, the thing that I try to keep as a mantra is don't just do something to do something, right? If you're going to put a honeypot out there or honey nets or tokens, you do need to keep track of them. Otherwise, what's going to end up happening is the same thing that happens in my house, right? So I live in the country. Um, uh, my property butts up right against a park. And so every fall in the Northeast here, uh, we get mice. And uh, those mice love to run around in my house. Uh, no matter what hole I plug, they will come in. And so what I do is I usually put a trap out. Uh, for those of you that don't like to hear that, I'm, I apologize. But for <laughs> I put a trap out and boom, I catch a mouse. And I don't know what it is about that first blood, but as soon as you catch one, you're like, I got to catch them all, right? Just like Pokemon. <laughs> um, next thing you know, because uh, I have a drop ceiling in my basement, um, I'm putting traps, snap traps everywhere. Well, the problem is, going back to your question, uh, Chad, <laughs> sometimes I'll forget where I put the trap. And unless something gets caught and starts to smell, I don't know about it. Uh, and it's not like I have a map written anywhere. Um, so usually what happens is I pop a tile up and then one blows up in my face, preferably not taking me or my eye out. So what I would strongly suggest is recording where you're putting them, right? So a good place to do this would be something like Jira in your ticketing system um, or write up a document in simple good old word. If you have a wiki, whatever it might be, record where they're at. Um, the other thing too is build a dashboard. If you've got telemetry coming off these honeypots, just like we do right here on the screen, now we're using Elastic. I don't care what you use, right? Your SIM can be anything. As long as it's pulling analytic data in and you can correlate events and you can make detections from the stuff that you're seeing, use it. In this case, you could use Elastic for free. You could use OpenSearch for free. You could use uh, Splunk, uh, the, 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 the community edition for free. There's a lot of options where you could centralize that data. And at least then you'd have a heartbeat and kind of telemetry coming from those uh, honeypots and you'd have sort of a dashboard to look at them at. So those are kind of my approaches personally. Um, I'm sure if anybody here on the, in the uh, video uh, or in the video in the live stream has some ideas, obviously you could share them here as well. Um, you know, we try to keep this uh, kind of a community kind of conversation, not just, you know, sound like the word of uh, whatever coming down from the hill. Um, you know, trying to tell you, this is what you shall do, Chad. Uh, if you don't listen to me, tough, you know, um, hopefully Chad's still on the call. I'm, I'm, I'm sitting here thinking to myself, you know, I'm talking to Chad, like he's sitting in the room, but I don't know if Chad's is still on the video call. So, uh, if you are, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that, I think that's it. We're just about out of time, uh, on this. Um, and, and so we hope you, you've enjoyed this. Um, Scott, anything you want to say, Emily? Yeah, I would just say, uh, we appreciate your time. Uh, we know that it's uh, precious. Um, check out the video. If you're watching this in a video, um, if you want to reach out to myself or Gene, uh, Gene, you want to throw up the slides again, real quick, just with our contact information. Um, uh, the chat in the QA, so I can't get to it, John, unfortunately. Um, I would, I was looking for the, I was actually recording them to be honest into notepad and then my machine blew up. So, um, I think Emily said that we're going to, we can download that at the end of the webinar. Okay. Yeah. Be, uh, so our team can pull the, the chat log and the Q and a, so we will awesome. get those, um, and we can probably put the answers up in a blog or something like that. So keep an eye out for that. Um, because we, we did have some great questions that we weren't able to get to. 
Um, so thank you, Scott and Jean, for taking time out of your busy schedules to bring this information to the community. Um, to our audience, like Scott said, thank you for listening in. We hope you found it, you know, worth your worth your while. And then um, for a schedule of all upcoming and on-demand SANS webcasts, you can go to sans.org slash webcasts, which is where you can access this one once it is uh, uploaded to the same registration page that you got here today. Um, but that covers everything from my end, if you guys are good to go. I think we're good. Thanks, everybody. Awesome. I put my email and uh, Twitter handle out there or in LinkedIn just for anybody who wants to reach out. I try to stay in touch with the students as much as possible. So if you have questions or you want, I can't believe I'm about to sound like a freaking YouTube guy, but hey, if you have any ideas on things you'd like to hear about, hit well, subscribe. Drop a comment. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously, if you have ideas, uh, things you want to hear about, uh, myself and Gene and a lot of the SANS instructors, we have more stuff rattling around in our brains than we can contain and we love to share uh and so right now i'm feeling very constrained because i can't share the normal way that i do so if you uh, have ideas or you want to talk about it more we can do another webcast we'll kick this off emily will be here one big happy family hanging out talking about all the cool stuff so all right thanks everybody have a great day take care bye